Hi, everyone. Uh, we're here today, of all places, at Armstrong Cable, their garage. And this is where we're going to film how Mark's going to show everyone how to do a birdhouse for the bluebirds. But before we do that, people need to know that if you're looking at this one right now and you haven't seen episode one and two, you need to go on YouTube and find them because that's when we talked about the bluebirds in general and we showed all the different houses and the locations and stuff like that. Mark wanted to do now how someone can, can anyone do this? Anybody can do this. It's really easy. You do have a couple of angle cuts, but I'm going to show how to do that today and it's pretty simple if you have a miter saw and a jigsaw. If you okay. have those two, then you can build this box without any problem whatsoever. All right, so again, if, if they haven't seen episodes one and two, go back and catch those. And then make sure you see this one, which is going to show us how to do the Bluebird House. And I think we're ready to go. And keep your fingers crossed out there and hope we make it through this. <laughs> Something like that. Yes, we don't cut any fingers <laughs> off. Okay, where are we starting here, Mark? We're going to start out, well, like you mentioned, Sue, it would be best if they saw videos one and two. And it was because of those two videos that we're here again for a third one because Correct. we've had so many requests on how to build my style of Bluebird box, which is this one here. This is a derivative of the Troyer box, which was originally designed by Andy Troyer in 1993. And up in Conneautville. Up in Conneautville, Pennsylvania. Conneautville, He's Pennsylvania. a Pennsylvania native. Correct. Which is how I got to meet him. He was close enough I could visit him and he showed me his Bluebird box and I've been using it ever since. I visited Andy in 1995 in the summer, and I haven't switched boxes since because his box is the best that has ever been made. And I did a couple of modifications on the box, which I think the Bluebirds like, so that's the box I'm gonna show you today how to build. It's gonna be the, I guess you could call it the modified Troyer box. I mean, your name, of course, is Mark Ritke. My, I'm Mark Ritke, so you could say this is the Ritke modified for your box, but we'll, we'll, we'll I think that. this is the box I've been using, and I fledge over 1,100 bluebirds every year from these boxes, so they're highly attractive to bluebirds, and that's what we want, is a box that the bluebirds really enjoy. Okay, so I'm all set to do this. I think I can handle it. Now, remember, Sue, we talked about these original boxes oh, with the circular I have one of these. hole and the big square right. where the back comes above, uh, extends above Correct. the roof. That's what a lot of people so have. So water can go into the back and get the nest wet and kill the nestlings. I'm hoping that today's video, that we can start a movement, a national movement in this country to go from this kind of box to this box. When I travel around the area, I see an awful lot of these. So these this, are the ones that people put on the telephone poles. These are the ones poles. that people hang on telephone poles, clothesline poles, fence, fence posts, posts, all and that. Stuff okay. Like that. And the, that's why the back extends above the roof, so that they can put a screw or a nail in there, and that way they can nail it to the to a fence post. And of course, any predator can climb a fence post or a clothesline pole, so your bluebirds are not safe when they nest in boxes that are designed for being mounted on wooden posts. Okay, so this we don't want. We to don't use. want that one. What I will say, though, when I come across boxes like that, I modify them so that they have a slot entrance and the roof covers all four sides. So if you have a box like that, don't just throw it away. You could convert it into a useful nest box for birds. Chickadees like to use this box, so it's, uh, and tree swallows also will use this box. So you can save that wood, reconvert that box into one that's safer and more useful to our native cavity nesting birds, okay? Okay, you've got those Oops. two now. Right. Okay, to build the Troyer box, my style of Troyer box, there are five parts to this box. There's the, the roof, the sides, the front, the back, and I think I counted six. I think well, I counted the, six. I count the sides as one. Okay, good. Gotcha. Yeah, because we just it's just this they're up they're mirror images of one another. Right. You have to make two of the sides. But everything else you only need one of, but you do need two of the sides, of course. Okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. We're gonna start out with this making the sides first. The side is probably the most difficult or sophisticated, you could say, because there's a bunch of measurements on the sides that you have to take into account. Well, what I've done is I've made a template. Once I've cut out my first side, I just make a, I made a template for the side, and the sides require one by eight wood. 
Now the wood you're going to use is going to be just plain pine wood because it's the best. It has the best insulative qualities than any of the wood out there. So you're going to use just plain pine. It's uh, environmentally more friendly. It's easy to get. It's the cheapest wood to get. And what I do is once I get my 1x8 board, I go ahead and I put my template on the board like this. Take my pencil, go across like that. Oh, one thing I did forget. You want to go ahead and do the angled side. <laughs> and since we need two, we're going to go ahead and just go ahead and draw out two of the sides like that. Okay? Now we have our two sides drawn. There we go. And what we're going to do is I have a miter saw and we're going to make those straight cuts uh, using the miter saw. Okay, I got okay? that. I didn't know that was a miter saw, so. That's a miter saw. I mean, saw. I don't know anything about this, so this is <laughs> going to be rather exciting. Okay, now notice my miter saw isn't big enough to go all the way through on the first cut. And so your miter saw, you've got to turn it over to the other side. I've got to turn the board okay, over and then gotcha. I can go ahead and finish the other cut. There's one board. Line up the first cut with the blade. And I'm pretty good at doing that, so we're good. Now we have our two. And we don't need this anymore. We don't need that. That's just the end piece for that okay. board. Okay. So now we have the two sides cut using the miter saw. Turn that way just a little bit so they can see that, okay. the two sides. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the jigsaw for cutting the rest of the sides. And then we'll have them all finished up. Now I have my line. I don't know if you can see that line on here. It's And now you have this part there, right? So you've got that. Yeah, so now okay. after you make your first side, you've got a side that you can use to make a template. Just put a card, piece of cardboard over that and cut it out so that it okay. fits that perfectly. Okay, so we have a side here and instead okay. of cutting the other one out, we'll save some time and I'll just show you one that we already cut out previously, okay? Okay. So now we have the two sides. Now, before we go on, I want to, well, okay, we can go ahead and put that there, okay? So the sides are done. The other thing you're going to need is the back. The back is nothing more than a two by four, which you can get at any that's store. Right here. There's the back. Thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. So you can see that's all that is, is a two by four, three and a half inches width, okay? And all you have to do for that is get your two by four board. And we already have one of those cut, too, We already right? have one good. cut, so right, I'm just going to show you that you just make your, your straight line at the 12-inch mark. Mark off 12 inches. I use a little T-square for my straight edge. So you need one of those, and we have and that here. And then you have your straight line. Okay. And then you can go ahead and just use the miter saw to cut off a 12-inch section of okay, that. Okay, and we're done with okay, this now. So we have the back now. All we right. have the back and the sides already. Now the roof is also a simple straight cut. For the roof, you need a 1 by 10 board. And the 1 by 10 boards, that's the biggest board you're going to need. They're kind of expensive right now because everything has gone up in price. So. Uh, you just, just have to make just one cut on whatever you buy? That's right. Well, when you buy your board, your board will be eight feet long. I get, I get an eight foot section, a one by ten, eight foot section okay, of white one pine. By 10, okay. And I do the same thing for that. Your roof is going to be 12 inches long, exactly a foot. So on your board, 
you're going to have eight feet long. You just measure 12 inches, make your straight line, and cut it along that straight line using your miter saw. Okay, so we can put one of these no, back. No, you have the roof. Okay, right. and you're already. We're going to be using one of these. We're going to be using one for. So we're going to take this the over box here. Together. Right. Okay. For the front, now this is the front panel. We'll hold that up, Sue. You're going to need a one by four for the front, and you can buy one by fours in eight foot sections also. And this is going to be eight inches long. So you just measure eight inches along your one by four board, make your straight line, and cut that using the miter saw, and now you have the front panel. Okay, and this is an extra here, That's right? That's an extra one I got, right. Is this one here the one you're going to use? We can use either one, it doesn't right. matter. Well, we'll put these over here. Okay. Now we got everything covered except for one thing, and that's the floor. The floor is probably the trickiest part. And that's the little piece in here? That's a little piece in there. Now, thankfully, the floor is also made out of two by four, so when you buy the two by four for your back, you'll automatically have the wood to make your floor. And for the floor, it doesn't have to be perfect. I, you, what I do is I go to Lowe's or Home Depot and I look for scrap wood in the scrap wood bin. And when I can find scrap wood, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can get that cheaper. And that scrap piece of two by four will work fine for the floor, okay? So they're gonna have to cut that piece too. They're gonna have to cut the floor. And that's gonna be a little tricky because it, the floor has to slope forward, and so you got to have an angle on the back. Okay? Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to straighten off. This edge here is a little bit high, so I'm going to cut that to straighten the edge. Now we got a nice straight edge. Okay, here's how we make that floor, and that's important because for some reason, bluebirds like a sloping floor. I haven't figured out why yet. I may have something to do with nest parasites, but I can't say for sure. But I really am emphatic about using a sloping floor in the bluebird box. I Did think he do that? Did Troyer do that? No. And he doesn't use a sloping floor. He has a flat floor and he has a wooden bowl inside. He puts a little sawdust in that wooden bowl and he says that's very attractive to bluebirds. Okay. So that's his, that's why he uses his wooden bowl. And in addition, but for you, you're using the, the slanted floor. I use the slanted okay, floor. And gotcha. the reason, part of the reason, I hate to say it, part of the reason I do that is I'm not a good woodworker. And to make a wooden bowl for all my 325 bluebird boxes, that would require skills that I, I haven't attained yet, I guess. <laughs> so it's easier for me just to make a sloping floor. And since bluebirds like it, that's my excuse for using the sloping Sounds floor. Sounds like a good reason. Okay, <laughs> okay. now we're going to slope We're going to make the sloping floor. Okay. On your scrap 2 by 4 you're going to measure 3 inches. And then you're going to make a line a straight line through the three inch mark. On the opposite side of the two by four, you're going to measure two and a half inches. Okay, so measure two and a half on the other side of your two by four and draw your straight line. Okay, now if you have a miter saw, you should be able to tilt the miter saw to certain angles, to certain degrees of angle. You want to set your miter saw to 20 degrees. We're going to make our two and a half inch mark, our three inch mark, and we're going to put the three inch line on the top. How are we doing now? Now we got the floor. Okay. There's your floor. Three inches across the top, two and a half on the bottom with your 20 degree cut. And they just have to make that one cut then? That yeah, angle. it's just that okay. one angle. In order to get that sloping floor, because you're going to rest this on the back, and it's going to angle forward like this. Gotcha. That's, okay. what, that's what we're showing right that's here. That's what you're showing right there. It's kind of angled towards the front. Okay? Okay, we got all the pieces we need. Now right. we're done with all the cutting. We're done with all the cutting. We got the sides, the floor, the roof, the back, and the front. But I want to go over one thing that I think is important to do. After you make all the cuts and everything, it's important that you sand. Got to plug that in too, everybody. Why do we have to sand it? We have to sand it because that will open the pores in the wood. And then when you stain it. It'll stain better. It'll stain better. The stain will 
Oh, okay. Well, it will stick to it a lot better. It'll soak into the wood better and offer more protection for the wood. Okay. So after you make your cuts, I use this DeWalt disc sander, which is my favorite sander. It's the most powerful hand sander, I think, out there. Wow. And in just a few seconds, Now, do you sand you everything? Sand. That's the back. You sand I, that's everything? That's the back. I sand everything. You're going to want to sand the side. Okay, there's one back and a side. Well, I already did that side before. Right. And I did the I did the roof before too, so. Okay, so we've got it all. So then. we're we're good to go. Yep. Let's do that again. This is all extra stuff I'm picking That's up. That's extra stuff there. Okay. All right. We're making progress now here. Now we can start putting our box together. We have the back, the roof, the floor. The two sides. The two sides. And we should have the front somewhere. So do you have the front? I don't think so. Huh? I got this one. Oh, is that the front? That's the front. Right oh, sorry here. about yep. that. Now on the front, I'm glad I got that because I want to show, once you sand the front, the front at the top, if you want to show the very top of that front on that box, right up there, I'm going to round off the edges on this, like that. By rounding off the edges, front and back, when the birds go in and out, they're not going to abrade their feathers on a sharp edge. That's going to be rounded, and that, that's going to make it a lot easier for the bluebird on their feathers and stuff, okay? okay? So go ahead and round off the very top. Okay, now we're ready. Now we're ready. All I got to do is find the screws. You're going to want to use exterior grade screws that are one and five eighths inches long. Okay. First thing you're going to want to do is put the sides on. And so we're going to put them on the side of your back, like so. But you're not going to make it flush with the edge of the back. You're going to put it a little forward. You're going to indent it, so to speak, about an eighth of an inch in, like so. Then you're going to use you got to always pre-drill for the holes because you don't want to split the wood. And I use a 3 32nd drill bit to drill my pilot holes with. Once you have the pilot hole, you can go ahead and put that screw in. You don't want to wrench that screw all the way into the wood. You want to make it stop just on the outside of the wood. Why? Well, because you can split the wood. If you go too far in, okay. you can split the outer edge of that You're wood. You're talking to bit. someone who doesn't understand that, That's so I, I got right. that now. Okay. okay. Now we're going to do the other one. We're going to make the point. Well, I got to put one more screw in. This is going right. to take two screws to hold each side in. So okay. about an inch from the bottom, I'm going to put in my second screw. We have one side securely fastened to the back. 
And we're going to do the same thing for the other side. You're going to indent a little bit from the back. Make sure they come out pretty much equal at the end. Drill your pilot hole about an inch from the top. While you're doing this, from start to finish, how long should, if, if someone doesn't know a whole lot and is following your directions, can they build this thing in an hour and a half? Oh, less than that. Okay. Yeah. If I have all the, once I make all the pieces, it only takes 20 minutes or so to assemble okay. it. It's not hard. Good, you're on a time schedule. And what I do, like in the winter time, I make pieces ahead of time because sure. I put boxes up all over. For the average homeowner who's only going to put up two or three boxes, right. it's not going to take any time whatsoever. Okay. So now we're going to put in our final hole, drill our final hole from the bottom up. About an inch from the bottom. Put in our screw, and then we'll have the side securely fastened. All right, now we have the size. Looking good. Got the back and the two sides on. Next thing we're going to do is put in the floor. And that floor is going to be angled towards the front like this. And just for rough purposes, I usually put the floor about five and a quarter inches from the top. From the top? From the top of the back. So five and a quarter from the top, that's from up here down, five yep. and a quarter, okay. Gotcha. So you can measure that. I'll measure five and a quarter from the top. One, two, three, four, five and a quarter is gonna be right about there. I make a line. And it's tilt, it tilts downward. It slopes downward. Yeah, don't go the other way. I don't think you can really. No, I don't either. But otherwise it would slope upward. That's right. not good. Okay, downward. Gotcha. Downward. Okay. So we're going to put the floor five and a quarter inches from the top. And you're going to hold the floor in place and then drill just once from the side into the floor. Just one hole in the floor. all you need is one hole, yep. I don't like drilling a lot of holes. I've seen boxes where people used five screws to put on something they could only need two yeah, screws uh, the, to do. The birds don't weigh a whole lot. They don't weigh a lot, <laughs> but the main thing is every time you drill into that wood, you Weaken decrease it. the integrity of that wood. And right. That's a point where water can get in and rot the wood. So the fewer holes that you have in your wood, the better your, the longer your wood is going to last. All right. Okay, one on the other side. There, no, only need one. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't put any on the other side. One oh, is all okay. you need. Like gotcha. I say, the birds aren't heavy, and that'll hold eight pounds without any trouble, and bluebirds only weigh one ounce, so we're good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Now we're going to put the roof on. Going to center it over the top. You want to extend that roof about oh a quarter of an inch, maybe an eighth to a quarter of an inch in the back. You don't have to be precise. That's right here. Just so you cover the back a little bit. Okay, okay? gotcha. All right. So we'll make our first. Make sure try to get it centered. You don't. You can eyeball it. You don't have to measure anything close will work. And that's going to take a total of five screws. That's going to take five. Yeah, I like putting five in there. I used to put just three screws in, and I'll show you where to put them. Well, Kevin, you can see that there. Mm -hmm. I used to just put one in the back and then two in the front, but sometimes that wood will lift up in places, and so you want to have that roof lay as flat as you can on, all on both of the sides. Okay. There's our roof. Now we got to put one more screw in the roof because that roof will wobble around if you don't at least get one more screw in there while we finish up the box. So you're going to put one on both sides of the back one? Right. Okay. 
Well, for now, I'm just going to put these two in, so because I'm going to show you how the front has to be positioned. All right, now we got the roof pretty well on there. Okay. But normally you would put three across the back. I'm going to as soon as oh, okay. we, uh, after you get your two screws in the roof. Now's a good time to put the front on. This is the front. This is where we round it off Rounded the top. Us, not to hurt the bird's okay. feathers. We're going to put the front in between the sides like so. And the front, the top of the front is going to, from the top of the roof to the top part of the front is going to be about 1 and 7 16 inch. That's right here where I'm putting my that's, finger? Yeah, that's the, okay. that's the distance from right the top here. of the roof to the top of the front panel. Okay, gotcha. Okay, 1 and 7 16 Again, that doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, like I say, I build these, I build a lot of boxes every year and I don't always measure. I kind of, I've got to the point where I can eyeball it and say, yeah, that's good enough. A yeah, boo boo bird can easily get in and out of that entrance, okay? So then what I'm going to do is drill on the side here into the front panel because that's how we're going to open and uh, close the front panel. That's that screw. So we I put need in. one of them. You only need one screw for the top. And that's the one you always unscrew to get in there that's to look the and see what's happening. That's the one that we use to get in and out of the box. Okay. Now, I'm right-handed, so I put the, and the opening screw as I look at the box on the right side. Gotcha. Okay, if I'm you're left-handed, you you're going to want to put it on the other side. Now, to do that, you do not need one and one and five, well, however, one, you know, the longer right. screws. You can use, what I use is an inch and a quarter. Uh, exterior grade screw on the but side. But if they use the bigger one, it really wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. Right. You just don't need it. Okay. Okay. So we're going to put that in. And now we have the front panel ink, front and panel that anchored at the top. Right, and that moves. Okay. Right. But then now what we have to do next after we put in that top screw is we've got to put in the two screws at the base. Of the, of the entrance of the front panel. One on this side and one on this side. Right here. That's because when you pull this down, the panel, your front panel has to stay in place. So okay. we do got to put one screw on each side. So I'm going to oh, put it maybe right about there, come down about a quarter of an inch, and try to center it as best you can. of these have you made? 330. Oh God. So we're going to put that screw in there. That Again, that's an inch and a quarter screw. Okay. Now the tricky part here is to try to put the second screw in directly opposite where you put the first screw in. So you want to come down about a quarter inch from the top of the wood and try to line that up with the screw that you put in. On this other side. On the Got other it. side, right. There we go. Now the front panel is secure. Okay, we've got the screw at the top. So the front, when, when I want to get in there and I want to check everything out, I only have one screw you on that side. You just have to undo the screw on the that top. side. And then these two that you just put in make it so this comes down. down. Okay, yep. got it. And if your front panel swings down nice and easy, doesn't rub against the sides, that way you know you did a good job of aligning those two screws up okay. opposite one another. Okay, so there you go. We'll go ahead and secure the front panel at the top as well. And you have just now built what I believe to be the most attractive bluebird box in North America. Okay? What you got to do next then, don't forget, we got to put in the other screws on our roof. Because we have a total of five there. So we, we have, have the three in the back. Now you're going to put two in the front. 
That's right. Okay, we got that. Okay. So three back here and the two in the front. Right. Okay. Done. Did it. Got it. Okay? Yes. All right. We built the box. We cut the pieces. We've assembled it. Now we're going to put the finishing touches on the box because this will make your box last literally forever if you take care of it in this way. Sometimes your wood will have knots like this. Over a couple of years, those knots will dry out and split open. But what I found is that if you use a good exterior grade wood glue like those two, and this one, this is my favorite, Gorilla Wood Glue, dries almost in five minutes if it's a nice warm day, and it's it lasts forever. Once it's dried, it's it says right on the back, guaranteed for life. Wow. So that's my favorite glue. So what you want to do, and not necessarily with your fingers, if I had a rubber glove that would be good, because you don't want to touch something like you know, glue on bare skin, but I will just real quick just to show you how it's done. Just take your knots and rub a thin film of Gorilla Glue over that. Check your sides. If you see any more knots here, there's one here at the top. We'll go ahead and do that one. Couple on the front, we can do those. One on the back, we'll do that one. And you're done. Get a little more at the top. And there you go. Okay, that's one of the things you're going to want to do to seal those knots up. And now we're going to do one more thing which is really important. We're going to caulk around the seams where all the pieces of the wood come together. Okay, and I'll show you where we're going to do that caulking. The caulk you're going to use is made by DAP. It's called Dynaflex 230. It's also guaranteed for life. Mm -hmm. Once this dries, it's, it's dry for good, it, no splitting, it doesn't shrink, it lasts forever. You can waterproof over that. And so it's important that you use a good grade quality caulk. And I spent years looking for this, I finally found it. I, I quit looking, I'm sure there's better caulks out there, maybe. But for our purposes, this stuff is just fantastic. So I've got my Dynaflex 230 caulk already in the already in the in the in the caulking gun. So here's where we're going to caulk. We're going to caulk around the edge at the top, like Ooh, so. Okay. Okay. Then we're going to caulk along the entire back. Let me get your your Kleenex or this one. I've got a lot of glue in there, but that's all right. That'll dry okay. And then caulk along the other side where the side meets the roof. We're going to do the front part of the front panel just up here at the top near the roof. And then you're going to do along the back and the long side of the sides. On each side. Now, as time goes on, will I ever have to do that again? Nope. This is once and you're done. Okay. And then finally, you're going to want to do the bottom where the side meets the, the side of the back. Right in there. But not where this here moves. No, you don't want to do here because that's your front panel moving. Right, so and front. you really don't have to because the roof covers that and that will sure. keep the rain off, okay? And then what, what I do is I just take my finger and run along there to get a nice smooth bead across the, all the seams. Like so. Make sure everything is covered.
Okay. And you got it. Okay. Now. So it's basically done except for the painting of it. Right. Just the waterproofing is all that we have to do left. Okay. Okay. Pretty much because we're going to want to mount the box. We're going to show you how to mount the box on the pole and everything. We're going to do everything today so you can get set up just the right way. Okay, now it's going to take, if it's a nice warm sunny day, it'll take a day or two for that caulk to cure. So just be patient, let it dry, and then you'll be in good shape. And you want to make sure it's completely dry before you actually waterproof the box. Okay, now we got to do one other thing. We got to drill I'm going to use a quarter inch drill bit, put it in my drill driver, and I'll come around so we can see this. And to mount the box to our conduit pole, which is what we're going to use, you're going to come up about here in the middle and drill a quarter inch hole. and try to go straight down. I don't always go straight down, and that's sometimes a pain in the butt, but I did pretty good there. So now we have our quarter inch hole at the base, the bottom of the back. And I will show you what we're gonna use that for. What you're going to have to do is get a 1 quarter by 20 hex bolt. And that's that right there. It's got a little waterproofer on it. But that's a 3 inch long 1 quarter by 20 inch hex bolt. You're going to want to put a washer over that bolt so it comes down to the end of the bolt. Then you're going to insert that bolt into the hole you just drilled, your quarter inch hole, and you may have to use a hammer to get it in there. Did I bring a hammer here? Yes, I did. Yes, you did. We'll just kind of... pound that in like so. Again, that's a 1 quarter by 20 hex bolt, 3 inches long with a washer on the front or at the end of it. And then you're going to need a wing nut to go over the other end of the, of the hex bolt. And I use a wing nut because I can tighten those using the end of a claw hammer. Go like this. And we're going to show you how that works here when we mount the box on the pole and then uh, put, it, put everything into the ground. Okay, once your caulking dries, again, you do want to waterproof the box. And I have finally decided that the best color to use is white. I've used all different shades of color, but last year I did a temperature study on nestling bluebirds and found that in the summer is when they're most susceptible to being stressed by heat. And so in the summer, it's important that your boxes are white. In the spring when it's cooler, it's okay uh, to have a white box. It's not going to hurt the nestlings because they have a pretty mm -hmm. good ability to keep warm by themselves. So I have finally decided the best color is white because white will reflect the rays of the sun and keep the inside of the box cooler in the summer. How many coats of paint? Two. Two, okay. Yep. And it's not paint. Well, the stain. Yeah, the stain. I don't recommend painting because paint, I don't care what paint you use, it will always peel off. And then you're down to bare wood once again. What I use is Olympic Maximum Stain Sealant in one. I use the white color. And I found this waterproofer to be the very best that there is. I've, again, like I did with caulk, I spent years looking for the best waterproofer, and 
I finally settled on the And that's Olympic, just the white uh, the Olympic stain maximum. Okay. Yeah, it's just a white stain. Like so. This already has a first coat. I did a first coat already to help speed up a little bit. So what I will do for this one before I put it out or give it to somebody around my area where I live, somebody who wants to get bluebirds in their yard, I'll give this a complete second coat. And you want to go everywhere, all around the sides. You want to do underneath the roof, underneath the lip of the roof in the front, and there. So if I want a bluebird house, and I don't know how to make one, and I don't have the ability, but I'm crazy about bluebirds, are you going to help me? I certainly will. And what will you do? Will you come to my house and see where you're going to set yeah, it up? Yeah, I'll come to your house and see if you've got a good yard for bluebirds. Uh, like I say, I, I monitor over 300 boxes every year. And so if you live already near where I do my bluebird studies and my, where I have my bluebird route, that would be great because then I'll be glad I can easily put a box up for you because I can include that box in my study and get you bluebirds at the same time. And what do you charge to put a bluebird house in my yard? I don't charge any money. Uh, I operate on a shoestring budget. And the shoestring budgets that could certainly be helped if they would give you a donation. If they want to if make a donation, to. that's fine. Donations would be great. Yep. So consider doing that if Mark does this for you. When I first make started, a donation. that's a good point. So when I first started, I did charge people for putting boxes up. But then I realized that when I charged, people were hesitant. They didn't want to commit to that. Mm -hmm. So my goal is not to make money. Certainly, that if you saw where I live, <laughs> you would know that I'm not in it to make money. Well, now, My goal is to help bluebirds and to get as many people interested in bluebirds as possible. Now, so this is all free if you can't. But you've come to my house in the, um, uh, in the fall and, and touched them up a little bit, too. Yeah, once the nesting season is over, I then go around one more time to all the boxes check to see if they need any repairs. If a meteorite fell on the roof of one, I have to repair that roof, for example. Uh, so I always check them once in the fall. Sometimes I have to bring them in and repair them. But ever since I've been using this Olympic Maximum waterproofer, the wood, that, that's the nice thing about Pretty that good. white color also. Okay. When it reflects the sun, it keeps the wood cooler. And the reason your wood splits is when it gets hot and dry. If you can keep that wood cool using a white waterproofer, mm -hmm. you can extend the length of that wood and it won't split. So usually now all I have to do is just go and maybe touch up the waterproofer a little bit, give it an extra coat before winter gets here. Okay, what's next? Okay, what's next is we're going to make the pole and the predator guard for our bluebird box. Now, when you buy your pole, and I want to emphasize don't make this box and stick it on a wooden fence post because you're not helping bluebirds. You're just setting them up to be slaughtered by predators. You have got to go the full distance in order to ensure that your bluebirds can nest safely. And you're going to do that first of all, first by making that box, and then second of all, you're going to buy a 10 foot section of 3 quarter inch metal electrical conduit. You can't use metal, wait, wait, metal electrical, metal electrical conduit. conduit. Okay, this will be 10 feet long. So the total length of this pole is going to be 10 feet long. When you long. buy it, it'll be 10 feet long, yep. That's 120 inches. You're going to cut a section of that off so that you can get the right length pole. So you, that length that you're going to use is going to be 80 inches long. So this section here is 40 inches because in a 10 foot section oh, okay, you have a gotcha. total of 120 inches. You're going to use your hacksaw. And you're going to cut it off. And you're going to cut it. Which you've already done, so we're I've good. Which I've already done, yep. It, it'll take a while if you use a hacksaw, but I need the exercise so I don't mind going ahead and, and, okay, and cutting gotcha. it open, okay? Now, here's the nice thing. If you have two bluebird boxes that you want to put up, you'll end up with two of these 40 inch sections. Using a coupler, compression coupler, you can then use both those 40 inch sections to make, make a third pole. So third you got pole. an extra pole. So Here that you way you're not, you're not wasting anything. Okay? Huh. Isn't that neat? Yes, that is. All right. Now, on your 80 inch pole, 
You're going to drill a quarter inch hole through here. Oh, it's going to come down six inches, maybe five and a half inches from the top. Again, you don't have to be exact. That's not something and that's And that one's critical. already done. That one's already done. But you want to drill a hole through that conduit a quarter inch like we did for the back. Mm-hmm. They're matching up. Okay. Thankfully, conduit is actually pretty easy to, to drill through, so that's not a problem. So now we've got a quarter inch hole all the way through. And then three or four inches below that, you're going to want to drill another hole. Because that's what you that's the support you're going to put on the pole to hold up your predator baffle. And I'll show you how that works. Okay, so you're going to use you can use your 332nd drill bit and then drill another hole about four or five, four inches, maybe even three inches below your quarter inch hole. You don't want to go all the way through, you just need to go through one side of that, okay? Now, you need to do something to hold up your predator baffle. Now what I use is these two hole conduit straps. That's three quarter inch, two oh, hole okay. strap. I knew what that was. Yeah, I've got a bunch of these because I used to use these to help anchor the pole to the back of the box, but I found out over time you don't need it. Just, mm -hmm. just that hex nut, just the hex bolt and the wing nut will securely anchor that box to the pole just by itself. Okay, so then I drill a hole through my two inch, or through my uh, two hole strap. Line up the hole with the hole I made for the conduit. Use a screw. And we got it, okay? Now, if you're only gonna make two or three boxes, there's other ways, there's other things you can do to hold up your predator guard. You can use, this is the one I just did, the two hole strap. You can use a hose clamp. That just slides down over the top and then you can tighten that hose clamp so it's tight around the pole. And there's enough part of the hose clamp sticking out from the pipe that it'll, it'll hold up our predator guard. The other thing you can use is this thing here, which uh, somebody told me about. That is called conduit hanger with speed thread. You can put this right, all, right over your pole. You can increase or decrease the width of that so that you can slide it over. I may have to totally take out the screw for that to do it. Put that over like that. And then put the screw back in, tighten it up, and you'll have that securely fastened to the pole. So you can okay. do that too. Okay? So now you've got the pole. 80 inches long. It's got a quarter inch hole in it. And it's got something that will hold up the predator baffle. So next thing to do is we got to make the predator baffle. And these are real easy. Uh, all you need is four inch diameter, thin walled PVC sewer pipe. Uh, it's going to be two foot sections. So when you buy it, it'll come in a 10 foot length. And so you can get five baffles from each 10 foot length because every two feet, you're going to cut along your PVC pipe. Okay. I know you kept this whenever we did the bluebirds originally, but how close can you put bluebird houses? Uh, well, for bluebirds, they tend to need two to three, four acres just for themselves or territorial. Oh, okay. So you're only going to get one pair of bluebirds probably in your yard unless you own more than okay. five or gotcha. ten acres or so. Okay, back okay. to the baffle. Okay, back to the baffle. So now you have your two-foot section of PVC pipe. you got to get a cap. 
and you get your four inch cap that'll fit over the top but before you do that you're going to want to drill a hole exactly one inch in diameter and I use this kind of drill bit for that I put it in my drill driver and I can drill a hole right through there okay so that's exactly a one inch hole I then put the cap over the baffle and then I'll drill a hole through the side like this and put a screw in through the side and that's what anchors the cap to the baffle. There it is. Cap just at the one end. Yes. Just one end, okay, right. Okay, good. Gotcha. This baffle will keep every climbing predator off that pipe. It will not be able to reach your nesting bluebirds in the box. Black bears, of course, can bypass this baffle. Flying squirrels can come in from the top. Very large eastern black rat snakes can crawl over the baffle if they start low enough and then come up like that. But those predators are so rare in Pennsylvania, I don't even worry about them. Yeah. Even black bears. Black bears are actually more of a problem for me than flying squirrels and, and large snakes. So. Okay, what's next here? Okay. Do what's we have next? our post? We got, the the post, the we got the post, we got the baffle, we got the box. All we got to do now is put the box and the pole into, put the pole into the ground. Okay, gonna, let's do gonna, it. We're going to look for a place to put your bluebird box. Okay. And if you got good bluebird habitat, an open yard with mowed grass with some scattered trees, you've got virtually a 100% chance of good. attracting bluebirds. Good. So let's put the pole in the, pile, in the ground and finish up. Okay, let's do it. All right. Now we're outside. It's, thank God it stopped raining. Show yep. us what's next. Okay, now we're going to put the box in the ground. After you pick out a good location where you've got trees around and open grass area like this, you're going to need a spud bar, sometimes called a digging bar. And the spud bar you want to use has a narrow tip at the end. This is sometimes called a pencil tip spud bar. I don't That's trust the kind you, you want to use, okay? So now you've picked out a spot. Right there in front of your living room window is a good spot, and then you're going to want to use your spud bar to make a hole in the ground. You're pretty good at this. I'm going right in there, ain't I? Yeah. How far in the ground is it going to go? Well, we're going to go just about there. That's about a foot and a half or so. Getting a little nervous with you having that bar. <laughs> and then what I'm going to do is going to go into my cement bucket and get some pebbles. I put some pebbles at the bottom. Take our pole that we're going to put the box on and put that into the ground like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Step two. Baffle. You got to put the baffle on. And there it's going to hang just like that. Okay. Now what? The box. The box. Putting up with an awful lot of abuse here. Well, you deserve it. Yes, not. I take the wing nut off. I'm going to. But... Got to drop it. There we go. Okay. Now we're going to stick it on here. Right. Right. We're face Kevin, though, so we're going to come in this side. Okay, we're going to come inside here. I have the wing nut. Got the wing nut. We're going to put the. Looks wing... like it's awfully high. It is high. We could put it in a little lower. But what is for demonstration? Just purposes. for demonstration, yeah. Ideally, you want the box to be about your eye level. For okay. me, that's okay, but for short people like you, you might want to get the box a um, little yeah, I'm always, yeah, I'm sure. That's true. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Okay, there we go. Now. That's it. Now we're not quite no. done. We got a very important piece to add to this. What's that? On the top of the pole, before you tighten your wing nut, you want to put a white bottle cap over the top of your conduit pole. 
That prevents rain from getting into the pole. Okay. Normally that wouldn't be a problem, but in the winter, when it gets cold and freezes, the water in that pipe will freeze and that'll blow out your pole. So you want to prevent water from getting down into the pole, okay? So then all you ought to do is tighten your wing nut with your hammer. That's why I carry one of these. Make sure that's nice and tight. And we're good to go. Are we and finished? It, and again, all you want to do is just get that snug. You don't want to wrench that in there. You don't want to tighten that so hard that you, the wing nut goes into the wood. You want to make it just nice and snug. Notice that that box cannot swivel. So I didn't need those two whole straps on the outside to hold that box there. That's just fine the way it is like that. Okay, last but not least. You want to put a little cement in the hole. I'm not going to actually do it here because we're not going to leave the box here. But a little cement, put that in the hole until the cement comes to the top. A little bit of water on the cement, not too much, just so you get a nice slurry. I wanted to make sure I use the word slurry. I never heard the term slurry. <laughs> You're making these terms up. Oh, I sometimes do. I think you did, <laughs> slurry. And then all you ought to do is mix up that concrete with the water like this. Make sure the concrete is well mixed. You got a nice slurry. And what I like to do is I like to pull the box forward just a little bit so the rain it's off the falls roof. off the roof. Gotcha. Now there's only one thing left to do. Get bluebirds. Get bluebirds. All right. And you will if you've got good habitat. There it is, the world's most attractive bluebird box to bluebirds, the world's most safest box. This freestanding system is the safest system you can offer your nesting bluebirds. And again, we really need to tell people they need to look at the video one and two. One and two, if you so check important. those first two video out, videos out, that will give you a good introduction to what we did today. Oh, fantastic, I enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you, you very much, it was a joy, and I hope everybody watches our videos, and if you have any ideas about other videos you'd like to see us do, give me a call or give Armstrong a call. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.